Here's a quick word from our sponsor. Welcome to the new era of content management with Contentful. Say goodbye to the limitations of traditional content systems and hello to a world where collaboration sparks innovation. With Contentful, you're not just managing content, you're creating content-first, multi-brand experiences across all channels effortlessly. The best part? It requires zero coding. Empower your teams to collaborate and innovate, delivering impactful digital experiences at scale. Contentful's AI-driven platform not only streamlines content creation, but also ensures it aligns perfectly with your brand. Ready for a game changer? Start with Contentful for free today. Unleash the potential of your digital content and drive your business forward. Learn more at Contentful.com. Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of Svelte Radio. We're back again. Ooh, I'm joined by by Brittany. Hello. Hi. And back today this week. we back this week. Yeah, yeah. Hello. And we are joined by another guest. It's Enrico. You might know him from this week in Svelte. Hi, Enrico. Hey, everybody. Enrico here. Hey. Hi. So before before we get started, Brittany, what's new? It's been crazy. I went on vacation last week, so I know I missed uh, our previous guest. I think we had Jacob on last week, but unfortunately, I had to miss that one. Um, we went to San Antonio, where it was kind of warm. It, it was like 80s and 90s Fahrenheit, so uh, what, 30? A little less than 30, maybe 20, 28 Celsius. Um, that sounds, sounds very but nice. it was overcast the whole time. So I tried to get in the pool and it was like windy and cold. It was like still not Ooh. warm enough to get in the pool there. So, but we came back and it snowed yesterday for Halloween. So, uh, that was, <laughs> we have like probably three to four inches of snow outside now. Wow. Yeah. We just, yeah. we just got our first, uh, falling snow here today. Um, oh, really? So no, it it doesn't stay on the ground though, because it's not oh, that cold here nice. just yet. Yeah. Yeah. Our ground it's is like, not that cold. I thought it would melt, but it froze overnight and it's just like mm. stuck there. Damn. Yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. Maybe you should just go go more south. Uh I've you know? talked about it. Yeah. We just built that pool though. So we're just, we're like 10 years and our kids are in school still. So 10 years. And then we will probably keep this house for the summer when it's nice here and then move somewhere yeah. else, <laughs> be that snowbirds for a while. Yeah. yeah. Makes complete sense. All right. Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's talk, uh, talk a bit more with, with you and Rico. Who are you? <laughs> that might be a broad question, but how did you get into development? Who am I? Yes, well, my name is Enrico Sacchetti, and I am a software developer based in the greater Toronto area, Ontario, Canada. And what I like to do is front-end development. And ever since I was a teenager, that's what I've been doing as a personal hobby. And some opportunities came along, and before I knew it, it was a full-time job. So despite my post-secondary education in video game development, I actually pursued a career in website development because that's where the opportunities lay. We have had so many people that are video game developers, like by originally video game developers on the show, right? Like yeah, I feel like that. Yeah, I, I, the person I feel that like did that's, Wolfenstein, that's the, yeah. the spelt Snuffy, version of Jason? that. Yeah, and a couple yeah. of other people were like in video game development. It's kind of like the music thing that we have too. Like a lot of people were musicians before they were programmers too. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Did you get into like the, the game development stuff? Was that because of interest in, in gaming in general or? 
Yeah, it, it was sort of a misguided interest in video games because as much yeah. as I enjoyed playing them, making them is 100% different. You need right. You need ongoing persistent passion for that. As I realized the hard way after graduating, I tried to get jobs across the world, particularly China and Canada, because I was pursuing living there. I actually ended up living in China for one year and became an English teacher uh, after graduating. Oh, so, cool. So that's where I, I learned how to speak Mandarin and and teach English. But even though I was teaching English... I had no idea you, you spoke Mandarin. Yeah, that's a thing I, I can do. But yeah. <laughs> aside from that, I, I found myself on the weekends learning code, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, because that was my passion. And game development was not my passion. In fact, when I had an interview for a job, they told me to my face, you don't have passion for games. And I'm really Ooh, glad that's rough. that happened. <laughs> as rough as it sounds, I was relieved because I realized... This is not for me. And I found out very early right. in my career. So I think that's a very good blessing. Yeah. Yeah. What so language was that that you were doing uh, like the programming video language. game programming? Yeah. In university, I learned C++. And that's what I used along with um, some Visual Studio uh, stuff and, and frameworks. But I never had professional experience game development. I just had a couple of portfolio pieces and I graduated with that. Right. So I was never a game developer. I was just a student of one. And then eventually I came back to Canada, my home, and got married, got some, got a job, and the rest is history until today. So I'm, I'm still strongly into front-end development, um, mostly in CSS in the beginner years, but then later in 2017 or so, I got a job full-time as a React developer, and I, got, I finally got really deep into JavaScript and things like that. So yeah. that brings me closer to today and, and Svelte. So what, what happened next was about a year and a half ago, I joined a new company where I'm still employed. And it's a small team in a large enterprise where we have some autonomy and choices in our tech stack. I, I consider myself a full stack developer, but I, I will really earn the title soon once I actually deploy a self-hosted server. Because we have our own on-premise infrastructure, we are absolutely end-to-end -end full stack. From the That's cables awesome. to the ground to the front end touching the customer experience. I love that. That's how Svelte Society is now as well. Completely self-hosted in my home. How's this that so, server going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's it's going great. Is it going the next good? Cloud is humming or humming on. I think awesome. I think for Enrico, the the location is probably not that good because the speeds are are apparently not great. From like the I'm when you're very close the, to Enrico, so you want me to yeah. you want me to check? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, I, I think you messaged me uh, a couple of weeks ago, Enrico, with uh, with uh, the the upload speed or something of one of the videos that you uploaded to to the server. Yeah, it to the listeners, um, Kev is referring to our shared server for this weekend's felt artifacts, which we'll get into in a few yeah. minutes. But it's actually yeah. pretty good now. Like I was downloading stuff at at least seven megabytes per second, so it's oh, oh it's okay. a lot better well, than what I had earlier. There must have been an issue with me or something downloading at fourteen kilobytes per second, unexplained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's let's chalk it up to just like weird internet stuff. That it's happens. a series of tubes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, so you mentioned uh, this week in Svelte. Um, but may, maybe, maybe before that, I, I'd love to hear, like, if you have any. So, you, so you mentioned you weren't a professional game developer, uh, but you, I, I assume you learned C plus 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 since you learned it in school. Um, like, is there anything that you feel is transferable from C plus plus into? into the JavaScript world in general? Or maybe you haven't touched C++ in such a long time that you, I don't know, what's uh Good question. Insights? This is a personal take, but I think C++, the language itself, isn't very transferable. But I did learn object-oriented programming, algorithms, data structures, kind of like any post secondary student would. Yep. And that itself, that also was somewhat transferable, but the real transferable stuff was the grit and the soft skills. Being able to not get frustrated and persist and study and iterate is the most viable, is one of the most valuable skills as a software developer. Being able to stick it, stick with it, and because this is top of my mind, because sometimes I talk to high school students about pursuing a, a career in software development, and what I tell them is, you don't need to be passionate, you don't need to have 
like uh, an innate desire to be a developer. You just have yeah. to have the persistence necessary to not get frustrated and to keep learning on your own because the passion for learning is the most important. So as far as transferable skills go, it's mostly that. It's just, oh no, I can't figure out how to send a div in CSS. Right. But wait, <laughs> I did know how to write this class-based object in C++ and I got through that just fine. So that uh, persistent nature is what transferred. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And as we all know, CSS is notoriously hard sometimes. Um, it, can be, it can be really tough. Yeah, but I did get deep into CSS in my early years. Uh, I love CSS. It's um, yeah. it's a good programming language. Yeah. I think you're talking <laughs> you're talking to two of the wrong people to complain about CSS too. <laughs> yeah. We like it I too mean, much. Yeah, I I mean, well, I mean, I like CSS as well. I I definitely always prefer to doing like I I hate it when people reach for the JavaScript solution for everything rather than just doing it in CSS and HTML. It's one of my pet peeves of, of uh, a lot of developers. I, I, I mean, I understand that sometimes you, you need JavaScript to, to do something accessible, right? But it's, uh, it's still... I bet it's much easier now to uh, center a div than it was when you started. Yeah, that was a really <laughs> uh, bad example. It's really easy with Flexbox nowadays. <laughs> I but... mean, it's really easy now. It wasn't. <laughs> I guess in 20, 2007, that's when I really started deep into CSS. Yeah, some things were different back in 2007, 2012. Nowadays, there's so much CSS that I can't keep up. There's so many amazing new yeah. features that I haven't even used yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, have you seen the, the amount of different like, like uh, units for, for width and height? It's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. I, I know um, they have a purpose, but there are just so many of them. I was going to say that like container queries is where something that's not, I mean, now it's broadly available across the browsers, but it's still not like backwards compatible. So if you have to support older browsers than the latest, you can't really use container queries, but that's where I like to bring in Svelte's bind on the window and like do inner width or something if I need it for, or not on the window, sorry, on the container and bind yeah. to the container width. And I can do a container query with JavaScript where I, it's, I can't really support it yet for CSS. It's fun. But the, <laughs> the CSS tangent aside, the, it was just a year and a half ago when I started my new career, my new job and working with Svelte. And I always knew about Svelte ambiently, like since 2021, I've, I've seen news and articles and I think, oh, this looks fun. I'd like to try it, but I'm too busy, but that's okay. So in here I am doing it on the job. And after like my first day or two with it, I, I thought, wow, this is so smooth. I'm writing so much less code than I used to. Yeah. <laughs> and that's when things got really inspiring for me, like super duper inspiring. It's because of that uh, saving time, writing less code and shipping things faster, right? Like write less, do more. That that ethos just showed up before I even read the sentence. And then I saw like rethinking reactivity and these famous talks about Svelte. And I thought, okay, this is big. This is This is bigger than me. And... The, with my background in community management, because in 2018, I started, I co-founded Design Systems Community Incorporated in Toronto. And we run a global meetup group where we talk about design systems. Because my job in 2017 at TELUS, a telecom in Canada, I worked full-time on design systems. So I did lots of React components, lots of CSS, and lots of liaising, talking to teams kind of like what Brittany does today, talking about their needs and making sure that we have satisfying solutions that cover the broadest scope and iterating constantly. And that's why we started the meetup group to talk more in depth about it for selfish reasons, as well as giving reasons. Selfishly, because we want to be better at design systems. Giving, because we feel like we can add stuff back. So, our, so to, to throw in a, a pitch here, our website, Design Systems Community, has a resources center, and that's where we freely provide talks and resources to everyone. And I thought, with my background there, maybe I can do something with Svelte as well. And I had this itch I needed to scratch because, as much as I enjoy supporting many different types of roles, because Design Systems Community is very inclusive to developers, designers, content writers, accessibility primes, product owners, at every meetup we run, 
we make a point to invite all of those roles at the same time and accommodate them. We don't want to make just a designer meetup, just a developer meetup. We don't want to exclu- make something exclusionary because much like design system work at a real company, you have to include everyone. You have to involve everyone. You need buy-in from everyone. So that works really well and it's been going smoothly since. So when it comes to Discord and, and joining the group here with Svelte, I, I sort of started low key, just hanging back, lurking a bit, to see what kind of small or big community this was at the time. And I realized, well, Discord itself is pretty cool. It's got audio, it's got stage channels. Maybe there's something we can do to have informal discussions about the latest and greatest in Svelte. And that's what inspired to be to kickstart this week in Svelte earlier this year. So uh, for for those that are uh, interested in in seeing more of the the designs, uh, the, the the design community, it's it's designsystems.community. Is that right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So cool. Uh, yeah. So this week in Svelte, you've been running this for for a, quite a while now, right? I, I don't even remember uh, when when you started doing it. Was it last year? So it was this year, was 2023, this year? February, this year. and I did a bunch of like non-recorded off-the-air streams right. on Discord, yeah. and then uh, yeah. and then you, Kev, came, came to me and said, "Hey, you should record these." <laughs> <laughs> and Brittany, I think, increased also the workload that. a lot. Sorry about that. <laughs> it was worth it, though. Yeah, taking no, on the it's, challenge it's been... of a weekly show. Yeah, it's it's to me, it's it's awesome to see that. It's been so consistent, like almost every week there's been one uh, and you always go through interesting topics. Community members can, can join on the stage and, and, and showcase stuff. I'm always stuff, in awe of how much information you have each week. It's kind of yes. insane how much you can, and that has to take so much of your time. I don't understand how you have enough time for all this stuff, but like, it's just crazy the amount of content that is put out. And like you said, Kev, consistent, like just every week. Yeah, if I can ramble off that a bit, the I think the overall time and effort it takes to plan, execute, and do post-production for a single episode is about four hours of my time. That's all together. And I usually do it on the weekday evenings because I have a two-year-old and and I, I love to give him my time, energy, and love during the day while he's yeah. awake. And when he's asleep, I get to do this week in Svelte. <laughs> and <laughs> the, I think part of the consistency of content is... Being the primary host at the time, I now have supporting co-hosts who I will give a shout out to. But in the early days, yes, I was the primary source of content. And it worked out because being a senior developer, I do have a lot of things I'd like to share with everyone. And I love the constant feedback loop because after each week, there was so many, there was a very diverse crowd of developers on the stream. Uh, on average 20, sometimes as much as 50 people were on stream. And they would leave nice comments like, wow, I thought I knew a lot, but you constantly teach me something new. And these are very senior veteran developers giving me compliments. And and they have respectable amounts of knowledge. And I just thought, wow, if I can do that, then there's like an infinite amount of things to talk about. Because whether you're a junior, early developer, or senior, sometimes there's just not something you don't know. And it's true. As developers, we can't know everything. It doesn't matter if you've been in the industry for 10, 20, 30 years, you can't know everything. There's just infinite knowledge out there and you may not be exposed to it. And that's totally reasonable and human. So if I could share my knowledge and information and perhaps yeah. selfishly again, learn from others and have them show up, do some showcases, answer some Q&A, then the content becomes a virtuous cycle. Yeah. It kind of sounds like uh, well, when I when I started this podcast, actually, I, I, I wanted I wanted to have a pod. I wanted to listen to a podcast about Svelte, but there was no podcast. So I, I mean, I started. I mean, the first episode was just me reading off new new versions of packets or something very boring. But then, fortunately, uh, Anthony and Sean and you, Brittany, joined. So now like it's a bit manifest better. destiny, <laughs> though you like create your own yeah dream you kind or of, what you want. Yeah, yeah, kind of has to work like that. Someone has to just like do it. Um, Mm-hmm. It, it is uh, in the beginning. I, I feel like it's it does take some time to get things off the ground. Uh, and the same with this week in Svelte. Like I, I assume it took a while before these other co-hosts started showing up and showing more interest and in maybe wanting to to 
to participate. Um, and that initial workload is, is usually, at least from my experience, it's, it's a bit more and then it kind of gets a bit easier as you go. Um, cause you also get into like how, how to do it efficiently and, and stuff like that. But yeah, so, so this week in Svelte, it's, it's a weekly show on, on Svelte, uh, that you can catch on, on YouTube. So what, what kind of stuff you, you mentioned, uh, you talk about kind of almost any, everything on there, uh, or maybe not everything, but, uh, anything is of interest because not everyone knows everything. So could, could you give us maybe some examples of, of what you've, what you've talked about there? Yeah, especially in the early days, my my Trojan horse topic was always accessibility. I sneak it in every time because we're all writing code in Svelte, which means everyone on the on the show listening does some amount of front-end development. And if you do, then accessibility matters to you. It should. And if it doesn't, I will make it matter. Uh, <laughs> so the reason why that matters so much to me is because back in my design systems job, I, I had to learn the hard way because I didn't care about accessibility as much as I should have at the time. So I wasn't always like this. I had to, through experiences and talking to like uh, people whose dedicated role was consulting on accessibility and compliance laws and things like that. And they uh, they, they taught me things I didn't realize. For example, my one of my most memorable lessons was I shipped a button component, you know, the, the famous button, everyone's got to have one. Mm. And it was bad. <laughs> it was bad because... When the text was too large in the French language, it truncated. And I didn't support oh. that because in Canada, we have to write things in English and French. Right. So I didn't test right. for French. And furthermore, I didn't test for increasing the font size because our browsers have two options. You can zoom into the page and you can independently increase the font size. And some people do that when they browse the internet. So I didn't test with increased font size. And when the text truncated, it was a bad button. And I was taught that it should overlap and wrap to the bottom line. The buttons should get taller. You shouldn't specify a maximum height. You should specify a minimum height. Allow the buttons to be taller. Allow the text to wrap, especially if they're off to the side in a card, in a container, and there's no room for it to grow wider. Good luck convincing the designers that that's going to fly. <laughs> well, uh, it, the simple answer there is, like what is a designer? A designer's job is to solve a problem. If mm -hmm. you're trying to express something, you're not a designer, you're an artist. And that's okay. That's a valid thing to do, but you have to understand the role you're in. I think what we would do in that situation is truncate it and then have a popover. As long as you have the aria, is that accessible? It is compliant, but it is unacceptable. <laughs> 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 so yeah, you, you have a means to read the text, therefore it is compliant. But compliancy is not uh, ideal all the time. But, uh, that's yeah. a funny that's a funny example you shared. But yes, it's when I work with <laughs> designers, um, I gotta give them respect too because it's such a diverse field in itself. Like there's visual design, there's interaction design, there's content design, and I think the the first conversations you have when you build a digital experience is content, actually, not even design. It's really by like, what information are you presenting to your audience through the internet? What things are your audience trying to achieve on your website or service or e-commerce experience? How do you make it easy to for them to consume, whether the content's written in English or another language? How do you make it easy for them to navigate? It all starts with content. And content actually is done in tandem with accessibility as well. This is such a relevant conversation for me because we're, we had a new product uh, director of design come in and look at our site and say that, what are our users like actually seeing, doing, how are they navigating the site? And we're talking about like redoing the whole hierarchy of the site because we don't feel like the patterns and the interactions that the users have are consistent and like, displaying that in a more readable, more usable fashion will lead to like increased revenue and knowing all of that as a designer. I mean, it's, it's a lot. Being a designer is hard too, but I've been trying to convince my designers that like accessibility is important and you need to know about accessibility. They think they don't need to know about it, but they do need to know about right. it and they need to yeah. use that in all of their designs. Right. So that, that's an excellent example. So back to Kev's question about where do I source my content? This is definitely one of those examples from, yeah. from real world situations, real job situations, 
trying to solve for accessibility and providing a Svelte solution is something I talk about pretty often on this week in Svelte because we're constantly faced with these challenges and people want to know, how do I solve this with Svelte? Well, we're here to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I get the impression that uh, a lot of the topics on this week in Svelte, like, for example, this this topic on accessibility, it's, it's not particularly Svelte specific, right? Uh, I feel like often you, you would, any developer would probably, um, what's it called? Um, crap, Comple completely blanking on the word here. Um, they, they would gain knowledge by, by uh, checking out this week in Svelte, even, even if they're not using Svelte is what I, what I wanted to say. Like, obviously some things are Svelte specific, but accessibility is for everyone. Um, yeah. You progressive could enhancement more is than for just everyone. Svelte stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's nice to, to see, see those, those topics being, being talked about. Um, yeah. So what are, do, do you have any plans for, for the future of this week in Svelte? Any ideas on what you want to do? Is that something you've, you've thought about? Yeah. So as, so as we discuss, we understand where we source the content from. It's primarily through ourselves. As the regular hosts, we provide the content because we just want to talk about the things we want to talk about and sneak in related front-end aspects. The future of this week in Svelte, I think, is scaling myself. Just like design systems community, just like any uh, meetup organization, scaling myself is to have this thing wind it up like a toy and let it walk on its own. And that's why I need to give many thanks to my current co-hosts. So uh, Kareem first joined it. Thank you, Kareem, for your support in the in middle days and for coming back too, because Kareem is a, a solid developer and he, he works a lot with like server-side events and things like that. And he wants to share his things on this weekend's felt because they come up on Discord a lot. Questions come up about how do I achieve this? And my breadth of knowledge is limited. So I need to invite specialists and and cream helped fill that gap and then Paolo Ricciuti recently joined and he's he's a regular co-host every friday as well and and he's awesome because he's all over the svelte ecosystem you see, if yeah. there's a github issue about something about svelte you'll likely see paolo commenting on it yeah and we've had so paolo is is one of the co-creators co of of svelte lab we've had them on on the podcast a while back uh if, if you're interested in hearing hearing more from Paolo, you, you should definitely go going and check that episode out. Absolutely. And now you're uh, you're going to start using Streamyard. Let's. Are you are you 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 said you mentioned before we started recording that you you've uh, you were on trying trying it out yesterday. Um, so what what do you think we'll we'll gain by by using Streamyard instead of just recording a screen on 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 a computer? It'll definitely help with execution and post-production. Um, I also want to thank my other recent host, Stanislav, for taking up oh, regular sorry. commentary uh, because with the four of us now, it's like, okay, it's um, that's great, but it's, it at times is, is kind of excessive because we can't always get a word in. It's sometimes difficult to coordinate when you can't see each other. So one of the challenges we faced with Discord stages as our primary platform of delivering this week in Svelte was we had to use OBS to record everything. I had to occasionally swap between sharing the Discord chat in my recording, as well as displaying what's on my screen. And because I don't have fancy keyboard shortcuts or or like a dedicated uh, switched device, it was really hard for me to manage. And I couldn't expect my goals to take that on, take on that complexity either, because we just wanted yeah. to deliver, yeah, that. Uh, Brittany is, for those of you listening, Brittany is sharing a really good shortcut keyboard that I think every streamer should have, especially if they're on yeah. a broadcasting service. But we didn't have that, and I didn't, and I wanted to simplify things. So StreamYard has many advantages uh, that I won't get too deep yeah. into, but it allows us to join easily, much like a Google Meet, and share what's on their screen. And there's a lot less time between handing off screen shares because StreamYard has a really nice backstage tool that allows people to preemptively share the screen. And in one click, you can bring it on or take it down. And with Discord, you have to wait for someone to stop sharing and then start sharing your screen and then accept accessibility settings in Mac OS because you forgot to set it up. And there's all of these things oh, to right, finagle yeah. with that, that made post-production a hassle because I have to cut those You're bits out. Yeah, and you're still going to have to maybe deal with that, though, if they haven't allowed Chrome or 
uh, I think Chrome is like one of the only ones that StreamYard supports, but um, if they haven't allowed it in Chrome, you might still have that. But the other thing I thought of that you might miss from stages is allowing audience members to come up on stage is something that that offers that you won't be able to do in StreamYard. So are we just going to move to just YouTube comments? StreamYard does allow audience members to join. As long as I share the link publicly, which I will do in the description, people can join us on StreamYard backstage and I'll invite them on if they so might like to. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So StreamYard yeah. has some advantages. I think there's just a, there's a limit on how many can be in the, in the backstage, yeah, I think, I think is, is the thing. It's like the total people maybe. Yeah. I think uh, limitations aren't too bad because from my experience, um, the good thing about our, our show is the agenda has been very consistent since day one. Like the topics we had have stayed roughly the same and, and I'm, I'm sort of happy that it ended up that way. I didn't, I was always ready to iterate and adapt, but it stayed mostly the same. But after the show, one thing that has to make the cut is the water cooler. We have this off the air idle chat that happens after I stop the recording and we just stick around, talk about things that are unscripted. But with the new StreamYard YouTube recording premiering this week, and if you're listening to the podcast, it may have already happened, but the the thing that we're going to cut is the water cooler. So the water cooler may end up uh, resurfacing as its own separate event, but we're not sure yet. But yeah. until then, it's just going to be a very uh, clean show that's that's sticking to the agenda, and we'll engage with audience members via YouTube comments and possibly StreamYard. Yeah, that could be actually a way to get more people to the Discord. It, since we're sharing it to the YouTube now, we have more users, active users probably on the YouTube that watch that than we do in Discord. Yeah. And you could tell people we're going to do water cooler in the Discord voice channel after or like create a channel for that. That would be interesting. Yeah, very excited to see see where where, where it's going in general. Here's a quick word from our sponsor. Welcome to the new era of content management with Contentful. Say goodbye to the limitations of traditional content systems and hello to a world where collaboration sparks innovation. With Contentful, you're not just managing content, you're creating content-first, multi-brand experiences across all channels effortlessly. The best part? It requires zero coding. Empower your teams to collaborate and innovate, delivering impactful digital experiences at scale. Contentful's AI-driven platform not only streamlines content creation, but also ensures it aligns perfectly with your brand. Ready for a game changer? Start with Contentful for free today. Unleash the potential of your digital content and drive your business forward. Learn more at Contentful.com. I forgot we I, I guess we did talk a bit about what what the work that you're doing at the moment with Svelte. Uh but what kind of stuff in specific do you, do you work with with regards to Svelte? Are you do, are you working in a Svelte application or a Svelte kit application? So at your job at your day job basically. Very good question. Yeah, how do I actually engage with Svelte day to day? It's um at my job. I also have some side jobs I'll get into, but at my full-time job, I use FeltKit to create a classic CRUD, nothing too special or fancy or novel. It's just a very uh, straightforward and tr traditional CRUD in which we have the adapter node used for SvelteKit. We self-host it, of course, and it allows our, our internal users. I build internal facing applications, so you'll never see these yeah. publicly, but the, the internal facing app facilitates some of our team members in other departments to do some sort of management. And I can't get into specifics, but the overall engagement with Svelte is just make a Svelte kit application. And my team is about five people, or actually it's four people, three, four developers, really. One of them's a director. We don't have a designer on our team. So although we chose Svelte as our de facto front end framework for our team and all of our projects, we actually have a lot of short term projects and long running projects on our team. Sometimes we'll work independently on six week projects and move on to the next project and the next project, almost like piecemeal agency work, but it's all internal facing. Sometimes we have long running projects and which I was tasked to do. So for the past year and a half, I'm still working on the same SvelteKit application I started. And oh, it's cool. interesting. Yeah, like I'm doing a long running project and it's it's fun, it's interesting, it touches many aspects of front end, 
but just in the CRUD sense. Um, the tech stack I yep. use is, besides Felt, I also use DoltDB, which is a novel MySQL database that is versioned similarly mm -hmm. to Git. So it actually has Never Git branches, but using MySQL. You can actually check out a branch, and you can do MySQL writes and reads on a branch, and you can actually merge changes just like Git. Oh, wow. That, that sounds, sounds really cool. nice. Does it Mar is it MariaDB that has branching? I think uh, maybe... Um, What's the auth provider that uses that? Uh, Superbase? Sure. I know that PlanetScale has does. branches. PlanetScale has branches, but there's another one uh, that just changed their logo. They use Felt and everything, and my brain is not. They they have Felt Kit on the page. We just had the person on. It could oh, be PocketBase. Thomas. Be... Oh, oh, AppRight. Right. My goodness. Yeah. My brain, I think they might use Maria <laughs> DB and have branching also, but yeah, my brain was not working there. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good. And yeah, my engagement with um, Svelte in particular is a very straightforward one. It's mostly light, light front end views. I tried to pursue the progressive enhancement form actions mentality, but um, I wasn't very successful. Like I still have pages in my app that require JavaScript to function, but I hope someday I can make it all work without JavaScript because a CRUD can work without JavaScript. Yeah. And yeah. everyone probably knows what CRUD means, but create, read, update, delete, just throwing that out there if uh, you don't. Um, that's like living so, the dream though. You get to work straight with Spellkit all the time and not, I mean like, our job has felt, but we don't get to work with felt kit. So I get to work with felt kit in the design system and then release it as just felt components. But like the main app, it's just felt three. We haven't even upgraded to four yet. Right. Well, neither have we, <laughs> but it's uh, there's not much to it. I see your point. Yeah, it's good to tell the audience what I meant by CRUD. It's um, a CRUD is something that lets you engage with data. It's just a user facing front end so that you can make easy changes to a database without having to use an actual database connector client like like Heidi SQL or things like that. So it has to be tailor made to our audience needs. It can't just be editing and writing and reading. It has to also have side effects. It has to have hooks. It has to have special events required by our target client. And yes, it is Felkit, but it's also um, atypical Felkit because we're not using traditional authentication. We're using header, enterprise header SAML authentication, oh, which is easier than it sounds because what happens is when they go to our Felkit app, they authenticate using SSO, single sign-on. And after that, our application will get some cookie headers that say, okay, this user is authorized. So that's the only thing we check for. Do, do the headers exist? Oh, yes, nice. they're authenticated. Yeah, that's that seems nice that's to not be nice. able to to deal with the uh, with the hassles of implementing a whole authentication flow and all of that. Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned you you've been working for for a while on this application. Does that mean that you uh, you experienced the good old days with the different router and stuff? That's well, kit. Or did you start using it just after maybe? Oh no, I used Svelkit before it was version one. We we had yeah. been using version uh, like. 405 plus the one with the the new directory based router so i think that's the one yeah. we were adopting or we had transitioned to it either way i was there when it happened and i was all right, right with it <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a uh, you, you also mentioned some some uh side side jobs side projects yeah, I, I guess to wrap up the work stuff, we, since we don't have a, yeah, a designer on our team, I decided that we adopt Carbon Components Felt. Uh, and I actually, because we use it day to day, I, I talked to the maintainer who Brittany had interviewed with this Felt Siren stream, Eric, and, and Eric invited me on to be a co collaborator maintainer. So sometimes I go in and I help close issues and make changes for bugs that I find so that I can help co maintain Carbon. And Carbon's fantastic. It's, um, it's like like many component libraries, it's not perfect, but it does what I need perfectly because I have an internal facing application. I don't have a designer on my team. I let Carbon decide my layouts. I let Carbon decide my interactions, and I just worry about business logic. So it saves me a lot of time. Yeah, and now with with Kit, when you put a lot of the business logic in in the load function and the form actions, it must be even easier. Uh, I know Carbon Carbon's components. Uh, have been a, a, a really full-featured library 
UI library for Svelte for a very long time. I, I even remember back in 2019, I think, uh, I, I remember hearing about carbon components. I might, I might be mistaken, but I think it's pretty, has a pretty long history. Uh, so it's been, it's been around for a, for a long time. Are you talking about the Svelte library in particular? Yeah. Okay, yeah. This, I think the design system has been around for a long time, but the yeah. Svelte uh, version of that is Eric and Enrico. And I don't know if there are any other people that help maintain that, but um, it is just a side. It's not owned by IBM, correct? Kind of. So uh, Kev is pretty close. Uh, I think early commits of Carbon Components felt began in early 2020, which or late 2019. Ah. And that was led by Eric and his partner. Uh, pardon me, I forgot their name, but them to start a Carbon Components felt. And the, right now it's currently just Eric supporting it, even though he's not currently an employee at IBM, but he developed it while he was an employee at IBM. So it's still IBM owned. It's still Apache 2 licensed. It's still their copyright. But and it's also their repository. So under the IBM GitHub organization, Carbon Components felt there resides. So it's still an IBM oh, product. Okay. But I it's sort of a it. yeah. But the governance is interesting because it's a if you go to the Carbon Design System website, and as uh, in case you guessed it by now, I highly regard Carbon. I think it's one of the the better design systems globally, internationally recognized. They do a fantastic job testing. Like their QA team is everywhere. Like I see them constantly auditing and sending feedback. I see the, the the leads and the designers constantly thinking about new ways to go, have interactivity without sacrificing accessibility. They're doing a great job there. And Carbon Components felt much like their Vue and Angular libraries, I think, or I may be mistaken about Angular. They are so-called community spinoffs in which they are, the governance model is they're owned by the IBM core team but the actual upkeep and maintenance is by community maintainers because they probably don't have the budget resources or need for those libraries. Maybe internally at IBM, they don't use Svelte or maybe some teams do yeah. at the time, but no longer do. The point being that, okay, we'll freely provide Figma designs. We'll freely provide the groundwork. You can use our React um, flagship library as a, as a ground or a grounded base, and you can build your respective library based on that. I think officially, Angular, React, and Lit uh, web components and, and vanilla HTML are officially supported and maintained by the Carbon Core team, whereas Vue.js, uh, Svelte Carbon components are all spin-offs, still centrally governed. That That's is interesting. interesting. Yeah, like the, these, these like uh, libraries that are started by companies and then adopted or, or even maintained by by the community are it's it's very I think interesting carbon probably has one of the largest supported libraries because like even material you can't find a good spelt material library that's maintained yeah. anymore um so google just supports i think just react or they don't even have their um components online right now it's um they're redoing their website so like you can't even see google's material um components but yeah it's just kind of crazy how much support and how far carbon has went yeah it's hard to yeah. gauge from what's public facing but yeah this is a this is a big topic in itself that i love to get into because i'm all about design systems but <laughs> Uh, I do want to tackle Kev's question about side projects. I am working yeah. on a job board, and I'm using SvelteKit and Fly.io as my host. So it's also an adapter node sort of self-hosted project. And I'm using PocketBase with it. And I think a lot of us heard about PocketBase. It's a very nice self-hostable Golang-based uh, SQLite tool that comes with its own Svelte-based CRUD to manage PocketBase itself. And it scales very well. It's, uh, I'd say unless you're like on a large team or a large company with a large user base, like a super large user base, PocketBase more than enough scales. For sure. I've been using PocketBase for a while now. Um, and as I mentioned on, on the podcast before, I've been rebuilding the, the Svelte Summit website. And it's just so easy to work with. You just change something and, and it it's just... It's just a joy to to work with PocketBase, um, not having to like manually write all the all the SQL queries to create tables that they don't exist, and all of this this extra work, and the the ability to just like export the the structure of it and backup and 
all of this stuff. Really, really, really fun, fun and nice project to, to work with. Um, I, I'm thinking of maybe using it for, for the Svelte Society website and just go all in on SQLite and see if anything breaks. Because the, the Svelte Society website would have quite a, quite a lot of, of users, right? And they would be doing a lot of writes to, to the database, where, which is where SQLite supposedly doesn't scale very well. And that's why people use Postgres or MySQL. I, d I don't believe that's true, so I want to test it, test it out. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But yeah. All right. Um, any any other questions for Enrico, Brittany, or anything that you want to mention before we move on to the, the next next sections? Um, the only thing I thought of is I don't know if we touched on the change logs. And I think I mentioned it, but I don't. Did we talk about how you go through the change logs of anything that's changed in Svelte in this week? In Svelte? We, I don't think we went through that, but yeah. Sure. This week in Svelte's agenda, the very first thing we talk about on the show is the change log. And I learned after publishing each show, I realized one of the most popular comments on the YouTube videos is thank you for going over the change log. People, I think, expect that segment to be the best segment. They want to see the changelog and they want to, to hear the nitty gritty. And big shout out to Paolo Ricciuti for getting nitty and gritty on the changelog very recently. But yeah, once I saw those comments, I had to double down. I don't just read the changelog. I also explain why these things change and what things change yeah. and where's the documentation for those changes. So yeah, it's um, it's not the biggest segment of the show, but it is the first and foremost. Definitely. Yeah, important. I feel like that may be one reason that keeps people coming back to it too, because it keeps you updated on everything that has changed and felt. It shows you, tells you why. It shows you where to go to look up more information on it and just keeps you in the loop of like what's happening in Svelte. Yeah, everyone should definitely check out this week in Svelte. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, unpopular opinions. We don't have Anthony here today. He always has one. Um, I don't have one today. Uh, Enrico, you told me beforehand you didn't have an unpopular opinion. That's completely fine. Uh, Brittany, do you have one? I think the only unpopular opinion I have right now is just don't mix bundlers and build things together because when you try to put V and Webpack and different things like Rails and Svelte all into one app, it's so complicated. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> difficult. Yeah, just make do you it remember easy on yourself and just use Svelte Kit? <laughs> do you remember we had Chris Toomey on uh, oh, way, way back? I think must have been like a year ago or something. He was telling us about. Uh, Inertia JS, uh, which is like a, a library that where you can sort of like wire together Svelte and Ruby on Rails, I think. Uh, Inertia has I don't know. Inertia JS, yeah. Inertia it could have been JS. just Ruby and not Ruby on Rails. Fully yes, client side render. Oh, sorry, I came across that as well. Inertia JS appears to be a tool that integrates traditional server frameworks like PHP and Ruby with Node.js applications. So I believe, I'm not an expert, I never used Inertia.js, but I believe what it allows you to do is ship a Node.js server with SvelteKit or any Node.js based framework and have it communicate nicely with PHP or Rails. Yeah, it says any modern single page React view or Svelte app using classic server side routing. So it would basically take your um, kind of like we do with Svelte and just use the client side rendered version of it and give you like a router and other things. It's interesting. I never actually looked into it. That is not how we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's uh, that's something you could check out. Who knows? Uh, maybe. I, I have a, an unpopular opinion. And the the unpopular opinion is that People use way too much JavaScript. M most things should not be written on the client. I had this, I think I mentioned the hot take last time with that you shouldn't use fetch on the client. I, I firmly believe that most things should not be written in even Svelte or JavaScript. I don't know if that's unpopular here. <laughs> oh, may maybe not here, but I think in the, in the wider front-end web developer community. community, it definitely is. Like, I think 
most people, most companies write, write things much. on the client. Yeah. They do their fetches on the client. They do, obviously interactivity is hard to do not on the client, right? But yeah, that's, uh, I, I think, I think the frameworks that we use could be simpler if more people took that approach. Enrico, you, you wanted to chime in here. Yeah, that, that topic comes off pretty regularly at This Week in Svelte. And, <laughs> and you worded it pretty well. Uh, one, one thing I learned to phrase things as is you should do one thing unless you have a good reason not to. And we don't want to neglect some developers who are working on embedded devices or novel situations like TVs. Obviously, if you have constraints and you're aware of your constraints, don't listen to us. You know what you're doing. But if you're right. building traditional web-based remotely hosted applications like Kev was just describing, and it's something like what I do day to day, which is CRUDs or basic user forms, then you should not reach for JavaScript first. So I could say I agree with that. Maybe it, maybe it is an unpopular. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Uh, picks. Who wants to go first? Maybe Enrico, you can go first since you didn't have a, an unpopular opinion. Okay. Thank you. Um, there was a movie I saw a few months ago, but it's still stuck in my head. It's, it's called The Wandering Earth Part 2. And there is a part one. Uh, both are really good spectacle movies. They're from China, of course. And they're like these high budget spectacle science fiction films that are based on a a novel who's like the modern day Arthur C. Clarke, but but he's a Chinese novelist. And so the the film industry there produced these big budget science fiction films. And I thought part two was like I'm getting chills just thinking about it. But I thought part two was very well done. It's it touches on so many thought provoking topics that that is executed on screen so well and so memorably that I have to recommend it. So my audio cut off there for, for a while, so I didn't hear the title, but from, from the description, it sounds like, uh, uh, what's the, it's like, like a book. No. Okay. It's, I, I thought it was the, the, the three earth problem or whatever it's called. Cause that's also Chinese, I think. Yes. There is a Chinese TV show called three body. And I think three body last, problem. it's, it's being, um, uh, localized yeah. as Three Body Problem. Yeah, Three Body right. is uh, an interesting uh, book slash show also. Um, you could check that out. I think the the TV show, the China-based one, is it's a very long epic. It's like 30 or so episodes each an hour long, and the pacing is gradual. I think they tried very hard to be faithful to the novel, and they got every single detail, but admittedly, it's a bit exhaustive. So unless you, you feel in the mood for that, it's a good show, right. but it's it's not for everyone. It's very long. Gotcha. All right, Brittany. I am having trouble thinking of one right now. All right, I'll I'll, I'll go. So I last week in my uh, drunken haze, I or no, I wasn't drunk. Uh, <laughs> I I ordered a, a Meta Quest Three, um, which is a VR headset, and because I I the thing is. I want to get rid of my monitors. Uh, I think uh, they, they're they're just in the way, and I want to be able to work anywhere. So I got this headset with the idea that I'd be able to just get rid of my external monitors and put on the headset and work using virtual screens in front of me. And I am sold. Like it is really nice. I can work anywhere and still have the screen real estate that I'm used to with, I'll have my editor up, I'll have a, a browser window up, maybe I'll have some documentation up, and it's it, it works really well. Um, but you're wearing a you headset? Have, yes. What? Yeah. My mind yeah, is so, like blown right now. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's actually really cool. So you can set it up so that when you're at your desk, you only see your monitors and it's just uh, like you're in a virtual uh, I office. need to see you wearing this on the stream. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll wear it next time because I think you can also activate like a, a webcam so that your avatar is showing instead of your real person or oh real portrait. But yeah, so so it's it's pretty cool because you can you you sit at your desk and you do stuff, but the the headset it's, itself has something called pass through. So as soon as you leave the desk, it switches to camera mode. So you start seeing 
the real, real world. That's if that crazy. makes sense. So you can just, you can still like go and get coffee and like drink your coffee and still see the cup people and et cetera, People might just et cetera. look at you really funny. <laughs> oh yeah. Pe people are just <laughs> laughing, laughing like crazy when they oh see me gosh. doing this, but it's very nice. So yeah, I can recommend so checking it out. And VR in general is very cool. Um, it makes yeah, me dizzy. It. I think the old ones were were worse in this case. I I've only try, ever tried this one, but I've heard that the the newer Quest Three is supposed to be very very good in Quest comparison three. to the other one. Uh, we have a PlayStation Five, and we got the PlayStation. I don't know what the name of that thing is, but yeah, it's PSVR whatever their, or something. Yeah. Um. So whatever that version is, and it's. I mean, we just got it last year, and it had just come out, so it's pretty brand new. But when I do those. Like I have to sit down because I can't, like, it just makes me dizzy. And I think if I did it more often, I might get used to it. I don't know. Yeah. If you sit down, it's, I think it should be fine. Right. Yeah, um, it is fine. Not but I still, around. I still yeah. feel dizzy. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> I even ordered like prescription lenses for them that I'll put inside. And so I, I'm going to have to check it out because I'm really <laughs> intrigued now. Yeah. I just take my MacBook and my iPad and just use that as an extra screen. And people still look at me funny doing that. Like I'll, <laughs> I'll go to the bar on Monday night and sit and have a couple margaritas while my daughter does gymnastics. And I will work <laughs> while I'm doing that with my two monitors like sitting in front of me, basically. If it, if it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> have you tried VR, Enrico? Not too much. I've tried yeah. Tetris Effect on PlayStation but I don't own a VR set. Uh, one right. of my coworkers talks highly about a glasses headset. I forgot the brand, unfortunately, but yeah. they look like traditional glasses. And just like what Kev describes, you can have three monitors virtually in front of you. And it's really good for yeah, airplane and travel. Yeah. Even, yeah, for travel in general, I think it's nice. Like if you're, if you're going away and you, you just have your, your small laptop, it's nice. I think that's the show. Enrico, where can people find you online? Well, I have a website. It's theetrain.ca. That's my uh, fun alias I've had since I was 10 years old. <laughs> and on there, you'll find a link farm to my GitHub, my Twitter. I am not active on X slash Twitter anymore. I don't really post, but I sometimes check there. I think, yeah, GitHub is is good. I am also the e-train over there. Yep. And you're and on Discord as well. And I'm very responsive on all of those places. So if you want to reach out to me for anything, you can find me on x.com or or discord awesome and with that said i think that's the show uh thanks everyone for listening and thank you enrico for joining us it was a super interesting episode and I'll yeah to have you we'll back see to you all. talk about just design systems like for a whole hour yeah <laughs> that could be great fun. i'll uh, and we will see you and uh not talk to you next week everyone bye <laughs> bye hey it's Kevier. If you like the show, please drop a review on your favorite podcast player. It would help out a lot. Thanks.